So welcome everyone and uh, thank you for joining this Africa lunch meeting organized by Egmont Royal Institute for International Relations on the Tigray conflict in Ethiopia. A conflict which since it broke out in November last year has seen the displacements of hundreds of thousands of people, the emergence of a dire humanitarian and food crisis situation, significant infrastructure destructions as well as the reported commission of war crimes and atrocities. So I'm Valerie Arnold and I'm the senior research fellow with the Africa program here at the Egmont Institute and I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker for today, William Davison, who is the senior analyst for Ethiopia at the International Crisis Group. Previously, William was Bloomberg's uh, Ethiopia correspondent from 2010 until 2017, and he has also published in The Guardian, Foreign Policy, Al Jazeera, The Christian Science Monitor, and other international media. In 2008, he also founded the Ethiopia Insight website. In today's presentation, he will lay out the dynamics of the conflict in the Tigray region, and explore the likelihood of continuing warfare, as well as the obstacles of a negotiated settlement and the con consequences of this for the civilian population in Tigray, as well as the possible implications of the conflict for Ethiopia and for the Horn of Africa stability. Uh, before we start, I just want to rem remind you of a few housekeeping rules, which is that William will talk for about 30 minutes, after which we will have a Q&A session with the audience. Um, the participants who want to ask a question, we ask them that they put these questions in written in the Q&A section. So to access that Q&A sec sec section, you just click on the button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and as usual, we want to encourage an open and frank debate, but we do ask that this happens with um, due respect for the speaker and for the participants. I would also like to notify you that this event is being recorded and will be made available on the YouTube channel of the Egmont Institute. So if you want to ask your question anonymously, that is possible. Um, when you write down your question in the Q&A section, just mention that you want your question to be anonymous, and then I will read out the question without um, mentioning your name. Um, so with that said, I now give the floor to William. Uh, thank you very much, um, Valerie, and good afternoon, everyone from, from Nairobi. Um, so I think my presentation, I, I hope, will sort of err uh, on the side of a fairly comprehensive overview with sort of appropriate levels of, of detail into critical elements. I'm sure there will be um, you know, very important parts of this, of this situation that, that I'll miss out, but we do have this lengthy Q&A session um, where we can get you know, stuck into um, anything that wasn't you know, discussed um, adequately. Um, so as um, Valerie uh, mentioned, we will start um, with the causes of the conflict, um, probably something which most of you in outline terms are, are familiar with. I think the sort of simplicity of that question um, is unsurprisingly not sort of, um, does not match that well with the complexity of the situation. Um, as with any you know, conflict, we can look at sort of structural factors, longer term factors, um, or we can just look at those immediate um, causes of the conflict. I'll have a go at just working backward from those immediate causes to try and reflect that. And then you know, maybe this is something we can go into in the Q&A. Um, on the 3rd of, of November, um, after political tensions had risen, um, which I will explain, um, Tigray's government, uh, the regional government, um, it, according to, you know, on, on, its, on its own terms, it says that it felt that a federal military intervention um, to remove it um, from power in Tigray region was imminent. They said they were aware of the mobilization um, of um, Ethiopian federal forces and, and, uh, and other forces around its borders. This led uh, Tigray regional government um, in partnership with, it seems, um, Tigrayan, ethnic Tigrayan officers 
um, who were part of the federal military stationed in Tigray. Um, that was a unit of the federal military, a very sizable unit, uh, lots of heavy weaponry and personnel that was primarily there to protect um, the country in, in terms of its you know, bad relations with Eritrea. Um, the Tigray government and those military officers, they moved preemptively, they say, um, to take over um, that section of the federal military known as the Northern Command and essentially bring it under regional command. This act, um, as I'm sure you can understand, essentially was the outbreak of uh, civil war in Ethiopia. It marked the, um, the, the, a very significant rupture within the military. And at that point, there was no surprise whatsoever um, that the Ethiopian federal government, and therefore the rest of the federal military, responded by intervening in Tigray um, to, yes, remove Tigray's government from power, um, but also to, as the federal government put it, to restore the integrity of the armed forces, also to restore constitutional order in Tigray um, by replacing that, that government. Um, now, why did they need to restore constitutional order? Well, then we have to um, go back a bit in time to something other than those immediate cause of the conflict, which was the, the that Tigrayan takeover of a, a section of the federal military. In the run-up to that, and you can read this in the crisis group reports that, that I was uh, very much part of, um, it was evident that political tensions were rising to the extent that the disputes between the federal government, Tigray's regional government, threatened to turn into conflict. Um, subsequent uh, to a regional election, which I will explain, um, in Tigray, um, the federal government said that that election was illegitimate and therefore that the new elected Tigray regional government um, was not constitutionally elected and therefore had no constitutional authority. At around the same time, um, Tigray's government said that um, because of an election delay in Ethiopia, um, nominally caused by COVID-19, that actually the federal government had outstayed its constitutional term limits. It had no authority um, to call Tigray's government illegitimate and in fact had no constitutional authority itself. So there was mutual delegitimization um, by, the, by the regional government and the, and the federal government. So again, you can see that what a serious electoral constitutional dispute this was, um, and we can see this as a cause of the conflict. Going back in time further um, into 2020 still, as I mentioned, COVID-19 led to the electoral board delaying an election that was set um, for, um, I forget now, the, the, end, of, the end of August, I, I believe. Um, that meant that there was no time to hold elections in Ethiopia, both elections for the federal parliament, but also for the regional councils, including Tigray's, no time before the constitutional term limit expired. Um, therefore, the federal government um, held a process of um, um, a process to assess this situation led by the Council of Constitutional Inquiry, um, which is mandated to, um, to do constitutional um, interpretation. Um, there was a sort of public inquiry. Um, they informed the upper house of parliament, which is composed of, of delegates from the regional councils. Um, and or people delegated by the regional council, I should say. Um, and that led to a decision by the federal government to extend all government terms beyond their constitutional term limits um, up until elections. It was that process and that decision by the federal government that Tigray's government objected to. Uh, they said that that was, um, they said that that was um, not legitimate and that there was no way that the government could extend its own terms um, in, that, in, in that manner. And that's why they insisted on autonomously holding their regional election. And it was that decision to autonomously hold their regional election that the federal government objected to. So when they went ahead and ran the election, they were described as, as illegitimate. So again, we can see that process of electoral delay and then the constitutional interpretation process that was disputed by Tigray's government as another cause of the conflict. But why did the parties 
fall into such dispute um, last year? Well, we have to go further back in time. And that relates, and I'll clump things together a bit now rather than going um, so sequentially backwards. Um, that relates to um, the transition in Ethiopia and particularly the change of power in 2018 that brought Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed to power. Pr Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed came to power on the back of popular protests and they were significantly directed at what was the perceived domination um, of the federal government and politics in general, including a multi-party uh, ruling coalition by Tigray's ruling party. Um, they had been in power um, for decades, um, ever since a previous transition in the early 1990s. Um, they were seen as overly dominant, having a disproportionate share of power. Um, and when Prime Minister Ahmed came to power, Tigray's ruling party lost a significant amount of power. Um, that could have been handled in a way which didn't lead to war, of course, but following that loss of power, um, from Tigray's ruling party and as, as, as Abiy took power, um, it led to an increasingly bitter political dispute. Um, the federal government blamed a lot of intercommunal conflict, particularly in Ethiopia, that we've seen in the past three years. They said that that was funded, provoked um, by um, Tigray's ruling party, um, the, the TPLF, the Tigray People's Liberation Front. Um, they said that Tigray's government, the federal government, said that Tigray's government did not um, comply with federal arrest warrants for people from Tigray wanted and former officials who were wanted for corruption and human rights abuses. Um, so there was these types of allegations from the federal government. On Tigray's side, uh, they complained that they were being um, that they were being unfairly persecuted that all of Ethiopia's political problems were being laid at their door. Um, and they, 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 they therefore said that the federal government's you know, accusations against them were, were unfair and politically motivated. And essentially, you know, many details to that, but of course this just led to an increasingly bitter political dispute. Um, in terms of the sort of structural elements, let's say, of that political dispute, Prime Minister Abiy, as part of his reform agenda, let's say, he decided to turn this regional, uh, this, this ruling coalition based, of, um, based out of the regional ruling parties, he decided to turn that into a single national party called the Prosperity Party. Um, and that finally took effect in late 2019. All of the ruling parties um, decided to join uh, the Prosperity Party other than the TPLF. Uh, they said that the process was, was rushed, um, they didn't agree with some of the ideological repositioning. Um, and they essentially said that ultimately it would undermine regional autonomy. Um, that made the TPLF the only um, party, the only opposition party to hold you know, significant power in Ethiopia. They became an opposition bloc in the federal parliament. And as an opposition party, because they sat out this reformation of the ruling party, they were the only regional state to be run by an opposition party. The Prosperity Party, chaired and led by the Prime Minister, um, holds control in all other regional councils, as well as in um, the, federal, the federal parliament. So again, you know, this very bitter political dispute, the power shift was then sort of compounded um, by this reformation of the ruling party. And then of course, that was late 2019, that led into the electoral constitutional dispute that I described in 2020. Um, this always happens getting stuck on the first element of these, of these presentations. So I'll just run through the deeper um, causes of the conflict very quickly. Um, as described, the you know, regional autonomy um, was an issue um, and has increasingly become prominent amongst Tigray's uh, ruling party. Um, this is not a new concern by any means. Um, the concept of regional autonomy, a constitution based on self-determination, regional states largely organized along ethno-linguistic lines to create a federal system known as ethnic federalism or multinational federalism by its proponents. That was something which the TPLF was absolutely instrumental in devising in the early 1990s after they were prominent in the insurgencies that overthrew a previous military regime. 
that period itself came on the back of an imperial um, system um, where um, Ethiopia's diversity was not formally recognized. Indeed, there was considerable subjugation and marginalization of diverse communities. The TPLF um, was against this. It promoted self-determination for Ethiopia's ethnic communities. Um, it is very attached to core elements of the federal system that promote, uh, protect regional autonomy um, and a system which is based upon the self-determination of Ethiopia's so-called nations, nationalities, and peoples. Um, suffice to say, that is by no means how um, other Ethiopian actors see Ethiopia. They see the federal system as very divisive. Um, they see that it's as something promoted by the TPLF in order to perpetuate their minority rule, as they see it. Um, and so this division by those who value self-determination, those who value um, Ethiopia's unity, let's say, um, is, is a huge schism um, and is you know, somewhere near this, this very, somewhere near the root of this very bitter political dispute that I've described as well. Okay, um, <laughs> moving to the conflict itself. Um, I've talked about a federal military intervention um, when the federal military went in to Tigray to remove the government, they were accompanied by Amhara regional forces and also um, fairly quickly by Eritrea's military as well. So those are three allied forces and they are up against um, a entity which has come to be known as the Tigray defense forces. Um, in terms of the motivation of the, like let's call them the allied forces, um, well, the federal government wants to remove the TPLF from power, restore constitutional order. Um, the Amhara forces want the same, but um, Amhara elements were also seeing this as an opportunity to reclaim territory, which they believe the TPLF took um, from Amhara administration, let's say, um, in the early 1990s. And this is a large chunk of land in what is still formally known as Western Tigray. Um, or Western Tigray zone, but also in Southern Tigray zone as well, a smaller area of land. So the Amhara elements also had their eye on these territorial ambitions. And indeed, as a consequence of the intervention, they have reclaimed and, and now, um, now those areas are de facto administered by Amhara regional state. The Eritrean forces, what is the motivation there? Again, they want to remove the TPLF from power. They see the TPLF or they present the TPLF as a threat to Eritrea's security and a threat to regional stability and prosperity. Um, some of that may be heartfelt from Eritrea's leadership, of course, particularly President Isaias Afwerki, but this is also partly, um, many people see, um, as an attempt by President Isaias to um, exact revenge um, on the TPLF leadership, which he fell out with in the 1990s, after having fractious relations as loosely allied insurgencies in the 1980s, and then they fought a war um, against each other um, in 1998-2000, the Ethiopia-Eritrea war, where the uh, TPLF leadership was very prominent in it. So those are the basic um, motivations. Um, and I think you're just to add um, the behavior of Eritrean uh, military suggests that they are intent on weakening or eradicating the TPLF as a political force, but also I think weakening Tigray um, and dealing a blow to Tigrayan nationalism, which means that um, it will be many years um, before there are people with a similar ideology who hold power in Tigray. That also seems to be a, an ambition of the Ethiopian forces. Um, just to quick, very quickly describe the conflict situation as, as we have it before I you know, move on to sort of you know, what, what some of the current dynamics and, and, and looking forward. Um, very crudely, um, I think the federal government is in control of what well, Tigray's regional government apparatus through an interim administration. The federal government and federal military largely control the main roads and cities. Um, Eritrean military um, holds a significant chunk of land across the sort of northern band um, of Tigray, uh, particularly to the north of these you know, cities like Adigrat and Aksum. The Amhara, as I've described, occupy land in western Tigray and also in the south. 
and then the Tigray Defense Forces, although the extent of their territorial control is not known, they are populating the rural areas, um, and particularly the rural areas in central Tigray, where a lot of the leadership, the military elite who defected, um, where they fled to um, after they, they lost power um, in, 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 late, in late November. And that's a detail I've, I've glossed over, but then I'm, I'm sure many of you are aware of that. The, the first month of the intervention resulted in the loss of power of Tigray's regional government. Um, so where does that leave us? Um, well, um, we've seen a devastating conflict so far, number of fatalities of competence nobody has any idea about, but it could be you know, a very large number. We've also seen considerable civilian suffering in the form of forced evictions, particularly in Western Tigray, shelling of urban areas by Ethiopian and Eritrean federal forces, and also massacres of civilians. Um, initially and most notably in the West uh, on a, an incident pinned on uh, Tigrayan elements um, by those who reported on it, although there is allegations that um, during that same incident Tigrayan civilians also suffered at the hands of Amhara forces. But then we've seen a number of um, massacres um, of civilians committed by Eritrean forces, um, including the most high profile one in Aksum. Um, and a lot of, well, a number of these incidents have seemed to take the form of retaliatory killings of civilians after, um, after confrontations between the combatants. So a, a battle occurs, and then after the battle, um, essentially, you, and in particular, Eritrean troops and Ethiopian troops have, have, have sort of taken out um, their anger, let's say, on, 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 on civilians. Um, although there has been increasing international recognition of the seriousness of this situation, um, the civilian suffering, the role of Eritrean troops, some of these atrocities I've mentioned, a very critical humanitarian situation. Um, there is increasing recognition of that. At the moment, there is nothing really to suggest that the basic conflict dynamics are going to alter. Um, all of the parties, um, federal government, Eritrea and Amhara, they are still set upon those objectives, uh, whether they are territorial, whether they are eradicating the TPLF as a political force. Um, and some of the outstanding federal objectives have not been met. On the Tigrayan side, um, despite the civilian suffering, uh, despite the military blows, the Tigrayan forces suffered uh, in November and December, they seem very much committed um, to trying to win the conflict, let's say. Um, they seem to have stabilized their resistance. Uh, they're mounting sort of regular hit and run attacks and also, uh, it seems, holding their own in large scale confrontations with the Ethiopian and Eritrean militaries. Um, so they also seem committed um, to a military solution here. Um, and at the moment, there is no reason to, you know, to see either a definitive victory for either side um, or any kind of alteration in, in, in approach, I'm, I'm afraid to say. Now, why is that? Um, well, first of all, we have those basic reasons um, that I've said. Um, everyone is still committed to the objectives that they set out with. Um, and negotiating with the TPLF or uh, anything similar would be a threat to achieving those objectives. Um, to elaborate on that a bit, um, at the outset of the war, um, the federal government classified the TPLF leadership as treasonous um, for breaching the constitution and attacking the military. It's not impossible, of course, in politics, but at the moment it's hard to imagine the federal government um, backtracking on that and deciding that negotiations with that leadership, which they branded as treasonous and indeed are wanted um, by federal prosecutors, um, it's hard to imagine them backtracking and agreeing to sit around the table with the TPLF leadership. A problem, therefore, is, well, what is the attitude of the Tigrayan people um, and the Tigrayan resistance? Well, they seem fixated on the position that the Tigrayan regional leadership that has been removed from power, that they are the rightfully elected um, government of Tigray. And we have talked about the Tigrayan attachment to autonomy and self-determination, that the TPLF is the rightfully elected government 
Therefore, there is no negotiated solution to this conflict without the federal government agreeing to sit around the table with the TPLF leadership. So we can see these apparently irreconcilable positions, um, which mean that no political solution to this conflict um, is in sight, especially if the current positions um, are maintained. Um, just looking at the, the time, I'll, I'll kind of skip through um, some of the remaining elements here. Um, if you put together the existing civilian suffering that we've seen with the prognosis for the conflict and the political dynamics, it creates a distinct possibility that there will be future civilian suffering here. I talked about the retaliatory attacks on civilians. I've also talked about the Tigrayan population. Well, I can't tell how many, but it seems a significant chunk of the Tigrayan population that consider their leadership that has been removed as their legitimate leaders. Well, if they maintain those positions and the conflict intensifies, then it seems that the civilians are going to continue um, to be you know, somewhat in the firing line um, of this conflict, let's say. They will be increasingly blamed as they were just last week um, or warned by the federal government that they must drop their allegiance to the TPLF leadership. But there is no sign of them doing that. So that makes concern that crisis group um, that civilians will continue to suffer. And of course, in terms of the humanitarian picture, if the conflict continues and therefore areas are hard to reach, and if the civilians are increasingly seen as a problem because of their support for the armed resistance, then that of course raises the prospect that a very critical humanitarian situation could worsen. And that could worsen as rains and the next planting season approaches as well. So a very worrying outlook for the civilian population unless there's some change in the conflict or political dynamics. Um, so just in terms of um, you know, what that might mean in terms of Ethiopia's overall stability, um, because the Tigrayan resistance does seem to have stabilized here and seems to be fairly popular in Tigray. Um, and then we have these dynamics that make a negotiated solution at the moment seem like a rather distant prospect. That does mean that Ethiopia's military um, could be bogged down in a very large, um, le lengthy and burdensome um, effort to pacify Tigray. Um, so far, um, because the federal intervention had quite a lot of support um, outside of Tigray, um, because the government successfully sold a narrative that, it, that they achieved a quick victory in the war um, and some other factors, um, it has not dealt a huge overall blow to Ethiopia's stability. But if the conflict continues um, and some of the government claims um, come unstuck, as has just occurred with the Eritrean role, where the government in Addis denied that role, denied any Eritrean retrocities, but has now had to backtrack um, on that because of the mounting evidence and international pressure, this could eventually lead um, to significant domestic discontent um, at what has been going on in Tigray and could therefore mean a loss of popular support for the intervention and the federal government, perhaps the emboldening of other opponents in Ethiopia. Um, and it could lead, be a threat to Ethiopia's um, stability overall. That's just potential. And Ethiopia is, 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 is very volatile at the moment and has been for some, for some time. Um, just in terms of um, the international or regional dimension here, I think obviously if Ethiopia was seriously destabilized, it is the absolute fulcrum of the Horn of Africa in terms of its positioning and, and size. Therefore, any serious destabilization of Ethiopia would have a worrying um, domino effect. More directly, there is the Ethiopia's rising tensions with Sudan, um, which are over disputed territory, but also over the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam and the quite intimate connection with the Tigray conflict. Sudan seems to have exploited Ethiopia's distraction and internal strife to uh, make good on its claims to this, this strip of land, um, Al, Al Fashiga. Um, there is also the prospect of uh, Sudan lending increasing support uh, to the Tigrayan um, armed resistance. If they did so, that would worsen their relations with Ethiopia and bring Ethiopia and Sudan closer to full-scale 
conflict. Um, there was also no sign of resolution to the re dispute to the Renaissance Dam. I think fairly obviously, if Ethiopia got embroiled in a full-scale conflict with Sudan at the time when it was getting sucked into a pretty serious internal conflict in Tigray, um, and also both of those conflicts, well, one already involves Eritrea, but Eritrea is also somewhat involved in the Sudan-Ethiopia hostilities, well, that would clearly be a very worrying situation. We would have to question whether Ethiopia's federal military and generally Ethiopia's stability overall would be threatened by that type of scenario. And of, unfortunately, that is a scenario which at the moment um, seems all too likely um, to, to materialize. So I think the point is, if the Tigray conflict continues and worsens, if the Sudan tensions and hostilities continue and worsen, that really could be quite a major threat to Ethiopia's stability and therefore, um, and therefore the Horn of Africa's um, okay, I think I'm basically bang on the, the, the half an hour um, intro there. Um, fairly imbalanced, um, got a bit st stuck at the beginning in terms of explaining the, the evolution of, of, of the political crisis. Um, but of course, we've got plenty of time to dig into any of the issues, as I mentioned at the beginning. Thank you very much, William, for this very thorough um presentation on the background and the current situation of the conflict in Tigray. Um, as a reminder to the participants, if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A box uh, down below and I will then uh, read these out. So we already have a few questions that have been submitted. Um, so the first question is, how have different international actors reacted and how have their reactions impacted on the current situation? Thanks. Um, so I think that we could see two phases to the international reaction. Um, people were distracted um, by the US presidential election, uh, the outbreak of the war on November the 3rd and 4th. Um, the um, the federal government obviously presented this as a, as a law enforcement operation that would be over quickly. Um, and I think a lot of international actors took a somewhat of a wait and see approach to see if the federal government would make good on those claims. Um, and then the federal government was able to, um, to strengthen that claim by removing Tigray's government from power on the 28th of November. Um, so again, at that point, a lot of international actors who would be very worried about this situation, I think they were waiting to see um, whether this conflict became entrenched um, or whether it would be over quickly. This year, essentially, um, we have had increasing concern about the humanitarian situation. We had had an apparent stabilization and strengthening of Tigray's armed resistance. And then we have had this drip, drip report of fairly shocking uh, atrocities against civilians. As the conflict has continued, the humanitarian situation has got more worrying and the atrocities, reports of atrocities have emerged. The international, um, uh, the international approach has changed. Um, notably, the European Union was quick um, in suspending budget support to Ethiopia, uh, its concerns on the human rights situation in Tigray. Of course, now the Biden administration has taken a very active um, and assertive stance demanding the withdrawal of those Amhara and Eritrean forces. So now we have the international community really increasingly concerned about the situation and, and making um, and a sort of piling on the pressure on, on Ethiopia's government. Whether that pressure will actually change those political and conflict dynamics that I described is a whole other question. In terms of some other actors, um, EGAD, the regional bloc, has been somewhat constrained here um, by Ethiopia's domination of it. And it simply has not been a prominent um, presence in terms of commenting, let alone mediating in this dispute. Um, we have uh, Prime Minister Hamdok from Sudan chairing EGAD. And of course, we've had the deteriorating Ethiopia-Sudan relations. I think the African Union is still maybe, let's say, formulating its approach here, but we did see quite solid support for the federal government position, chairperson of the African Union Commission, um, talking about you know, the threat to the constitutional integrity and 
constitutional order and state integrity and therefore the legitimacy of the federal government intervention. Um, so I guess we're yet to see if there's going to be an evolution of that position from, 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 the, from the African Union. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there in terms of the international action, but do feel free to follow up. Uh, thank you. Then the second question is, um, what are the main aims of Eritrea's involvement in this crisis? Well, um, I mean, you know, to, to remove the, the TPLF from, from power along with the federal government and to eliminate the TPLF, which is the arch enemy um, of President Isaiah Safwerki and his allies, um, and, and to eradicate the TPLF as a, as a political force. Um, that is evidently um, their objective. Um, and then you get into more contested territory. We've seen this systemic looting, for example, of Tigrayan public and private property by Eritrean troops during the conflict. That has led to accusations which are, you know, or theories which are fairly convincing from the Tigrayan side, saying that actually the Eritrean um, ambition here is to ensure that really no Tigrayan government, um, no Tigrayan elite um, is anything of a regional rival to Eritrea, let alone a threat to Eritrea's security. Um, but whilst I think it's pretty uncontested that uh, Eritrea wants to destroy the TPLF as a political force, obviously it's more contested about those sort of like, let's say, um, you know, uh, larger ambitions. And I, sorry, I, I should also mention that, you know, the territorial dispute that there's the final trigger in the 1998 war, um, this conflict between internal conflict in Ethiopia, that gave Eritrea the perfect opportunity to, to take back the territory which Ethiopia had not returned because of the failure to implement uh, the 2002 border commission. So these are, are disputed, well, not border areas which Ethiopia held onto um, after that ruling in, in, in 2002. And of course, the TPLF um, and Tigray's government was blamed by Eritrea um, for their intransigence in terms of implementing the, the border commission's ruling. Thank you. Um, maybe a linked question to that that is being raised is how do we have to see or analyze the peace agreement between Afewerki and Abiye on the one hand and the involvement of the Eritrean troops in the Tigray region on the other hand? The problem with the 2018 rapprochement um, was how to deal with the TPLF and the Tigray question. Um, it did seem very much like a rapprochement between two leaders um, or two federal governments, you could say, um, but it didn't really include in a meaningful way that TPLF leadership. And it was the TPLF leadership that had the absolutely terrible, toxic relations with Eritrea's leadership. So when you factor in all of those internal Ethiopian political problems I described, the failure to manage the TPLF's loss of power, um, the subsequent disputes you know, leading to this electoral constitutional dispute and the war, um, well, you know, we saw a similar failure to do anything about those terrible relations between um, President Desires, particularly, and the TPLF leadership. I think it's reasonable to suspect that in 2018, when um, President Desires made peace with Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, President Desires had no intention whatsoever of making peace with the TPLF leadership. Of course, exactly what his intentions were. Um, and any subsequent Eritrean involvement in Ethiopia's internal problems is, you know, a much, much harder thing to pin down. Um, but we could see the, uh, the, 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 the incomplete nature of the peace agreement because of the way that um, just a couple of years later, um, Eritrea has, has, has joined the federal intervention um, to eradicate the TPLF as a political force. Um, then some of the questions relate more to the element that you, you addressed about the, the legitimacy um, of the, the TPLF. And so one question that is asked is, what is the legitimacy of the transitional authorities amongst the population or within the population? Thanks. Um, just a sort of you know, caveat. I mean, obviously it's hard to assess the, 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 you know, the sentiment of a population, a population of around 6 million people at any point in time, anywhere. Uh, it's difficult in Ethiopia generally. Um, we don't even have you know, like opinion polling for that type of thing. 
when you've got a conflict situation, an internet blackout, um, and a propaganda war raging, it is particularly difficult to assess the sentiment of a population. But I'll, I'll answer the question, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, the impression is that, um, that the interim administration um, is obviously something which was appointed by the federal government. Um, and for many Tigrayans, including, I guess, the vast majority of the 2.8 million who voted for the TPLF in that September regional election, uh, they see the TPLF as the legitimate government and they see um, the interim government and the officials that populate it um, as not legitimate representatives of, of the Tigrayan people. You know, to quantify that is, of course, really difficult. That doesn't mean that people don't, in Tigray don't want the interim government to try and restore some basic public services. Um, of course, uh, they, the, plenty of Tigrayan people will be supportive of when the Tigrayan interim officials have spoken out about the humanitarian situation, about what Tigrayans, many Tigrayans see as the Amhara annexation of, of Tigray's territory, and of course, the role of the Eritrean troops. So it is by no means one-way traffic, um, but it does seem plenty of reason to think um, that the Tigrayan, that, um, it, there is, well, let's say there is no reason to think that a majority of the Tigrayan population considers the interim government appointed by the federal government as the legitimate representatives of the Tigrayan people. And linked to that, there are more questions about what exactly the TPLF's strategy and strength are. Um, so one um, person asks, there are rumors of TPLF recruiting also because of the anger and distrust amongst young people. Do we see more recruitment movements towards the TPLF? Uh, the TPLF are also attacking ambushing road positions for weapons. So does that mean they're reorganizing themselves? Yeah, really, really important, important stuff. Maybe something that didn't come out in my, in my presentation was you know, I think for everyone involved in this conflict, taking an interest in it, concerned about it, assessing the, the, the strength um, of this, you know, so, the so-called Tigray Defense Forces and the level of, of popular support for them and their supply lines, incredibly important factor in terms of you know, trying to work out what, what might happen next and therefore formulating positions and, and, and responses. Um, yes, you know, consistent reports um, of uh, recruitment, um, especially of young men in Tigray, um, in, including, you know, after atrocities have occurred or news has spread of atrocities, people, uh, you know, common mantras like, why would we wait here and, and be massacred in our homes? Um, you know, why not go and join the rebellion? Thing. Um, again, you know, caveats, um, hard to verify any of this, but consistent reports of you know, recruitment, but not forced recruitment of actually, you know, Tigrayan youth opposed to the federal intervention and everything, that, everything that's come with it, joining up to the Tigray Defense Forces. Um, a couple of points, other points about the resistance. I think many people um, have remarked upon the fact that there is no real external support um, for that removed Tigray leadership. Uh, there was an effective blockade um, on, on Tigray um, whether in terms of sort of economic um, interaction, telecommunications, transport, etc., we've got the Amhara in the west uh, preventing access to Sudan, and then certainly initially there was the Sudanese military manning the border to prevent uh, Sudan being used as a rear base and a supply route for the TPLF forces, as occurred in the 1980s. Um, to the south, of course, we have the Ethiopian federal forces and the Amhara. So there is no real external support coming there. And then from the north, um, we, have, um, we have the Eritrean military. So there has been you know, very significant containment, um, let's say, of, of the Tigrayan resistance. However, um, the claim from associated with um, the leadership in Tigray from the beginning has been that they will be able to survive uh, by capturing those weapons that was mentioned by the in the question and also through the support um, of Tigray's population. And again, very, very tell, but we do seem to be in a situation where in November, the TPLF lost government power. In December, they were on the run. They were trying to survive. Um, they faced a concerted um, aerial attacks, including from, from drones. 
Um, and also, you know, they needed to re-strategize because they did not expect to lose regional power um, and to face such overwhelming force. It seems that in January and February and now March, they have consolidated. They are more of a mobile, um, likely armed, um, sort of hybrid insurgency conventional army. Um, and again, it does seem that they have considerable popular support. Um, so I think you know, that's just is some insights into my understanding of the conflict situation and, and the strength or otherwise of the resistance. Thank you very much. That neatly answers another question that was asked about the, exactly that issue of how much support, um, external support, um, the TPLF um, receives. But mm -hmm. I would want to tack on a question of myself, Dan, is um, you, you mentioned in your presentation that you see all the parties involved at the moment um, staying committed to trying to uh, gain a military victory and to stick to their objectives. But the question I have then is based on what you just said, how feasible is that for the TPLF? How much longer can they maintain or can they sustain this military option? It seems well. I mean, I've, I've mentioned the apparent you know, stabilization of the of that of the, of the Tigray defense forces um, and and the popular support for it. Um, I think I think the first thing to say is that you know some of the Tigrayan activists, let's say, they'll tell me that um, the Tigray defense forces will be walking back into Mekelle, the regional capital, capital, within weeks. It's very hard to envisage that happening. Um, unless there was a significant change in the approach from the e Ethiopian and Eritrean leadership. Um, obviously, they control, um, yeah, they have considerable levers of power um, in terms of the conflict situation, um, but also they have the ability to commit um, increasing amounts of manpower um, to trying to control any Tigrayan resistance um, and indeed to replace um, any fatalities that they suffer on the battlefield. And again, that's a very hard, hard thing to quantify. Um, so I think the idea that the Tigrayan resistance will be able to you know, remove all the, you know, repel all the invading forces from Tigray, um, as, as the leadership claims they're going to do, it's hard to see that happening. Um, looking at it from the other perspective, there is reason to think, of course, that this um, sort of asphyxiation um, of the Tigrayan resistance could continue, could become more effective. Um, but it does seem that, you know, perhaps with those deteriorations with Sudan, that there may be support um, or uh, you know, pressure relief opening up in the West for the Tigrayan resistance. Um, they, they do claim to be capturing, you know, increasing amounts of ammunition and, and weapons. Um, so maybe they're okay in that regard. Um, I believe that fuel is an ongoing concern for the resistance, but then it is quite a lightly, ar lightly armed, sort of not particularly mechanized um, um, resistance, insurgency at this point in time. And then, of course, there is the food situation. And I think this is an incredib incredibly worrying nexus because um, presumably, you know, the Tigrayan uh, defense forces are already struggling somewhat to feed their forces, but we know that the population in, in rural areas of central and eastern Tigray, well, they're on the verge of famine conditions, according to FuseNet. Um, so if we follow through some of the logic here in terms of trying to separate the civilian population in Tigray from the armed resistance, from the Tigray defense forces um, in this very critical humanitarian situation where food could be an important pressure point in terms of the strength of the Tigrayan resistance, that does raise a very worrying prospect um, for that humanitarian situation? And, and will it increasingly be something that is exacerbated um, by the sort of logic of, of, the, of the conflict and the approach of the, of the various actors here? Another question that a participant raises is that given that Abye and uh, let Amhara and Eritrean forces occupy land, evict, humiliate and kill Tigrayan people, most Tigrayans believe that it is the war against um, that the government is waging a war against the people and not just against the TPLF. Can you comment on that? I think that's reflected um, in my 
um, in my comments so far about the level of popular support that I perceive um, for the Tigray Defence Forces and the, for the TPLF as the legit legitimately elected government of the Tigrayan people. I, I think it is quite a, a nuanced question um, at, this, at this point. Certainly that is the perception of many Tigrayans. Um, and yes, the TPLF is an absolutely critical player here, but we should note that there are people who've been opponents of the TPLF for decades um, who are essentially supporting the Tigray Defense Forces and the resistance against the Ethiopian Federal Military, the Amhara Forces and the Eritreans. So we can see something broader than the TPLF that's emerging. Indeed, the two highest commanders of the Tigray Defense Forces, according to reports, um, one of those was a sort of former TPLF dissident. So again, we can see a broader Tigrayan um, coalition against the, um, against the intervention kind of more than they are for the TPLF. Um, and then of course, you know, I've mentioned the systemic looting of, of Tigrayan public property. Well, understandably Tigrayan people see that as an attack on them and their society and their wealth and something much broader than an attack on the ruling party. There's many nuances to this question, partly because of just how embedded um, and how entrenched the TPLF is in Tigrayan society and how the Tigrayan people perceive the TPLF, which is of course a liberating force for the Tigrayan people having overthrown the military regime in 1991 and fought a long rebellion. There are many nuances to this, but I mean, I think there's, there is reason to think that you know, the, the, the sentiments described by the, um, by the, the question are, are, are somewhat accurate. And another maybe quite controversial question is, um, the military generals of um, Abiyeh's government and Amhara regional state police chief were heard saying that they finalized preparations for the armed conflict against the Tigrayan government. Does this indicate that Abiyeh and his allies pre-planned the war? I think there's a clear path through this debate um, for those who are interested in understanding the facts and, and therefore trying to establish some sort of consensus. I mean, I gave a, what I hoped was a you know, somewhat, you know, kind of structured, comprehensive, blow by blow account of the path to war. Um, in the weeks and months um, preceding the conflict, Tigray's executive was described as illegitimate by the federal government. That was ruled upon by the House of Federation. There was a decision to redirect the federal budget away from the regional ex executive to the lower echelons of the regional government. There was an um, build up of the, the military um, prowess in, in Tigray, uh, but also in the federal government is acknowledged by Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed in his address to parliament announcing victory on, on I think, December the 1st. There was evident preparation for war, both in terms of legal, political and military terms on both sides here. Um, the only real question, if there was going to be no attempt um, to, you know, to come to some sort of agreement about the political dispute. Um, but given that the federal government had ruled Tigray's executive as holding power illegitimately, it looked almost inevitable that there was going to be a federal intervention to remove Tigray's government from power, unless there was the very unlikely eventuality that they just abdicated power voluntarily. So absolutely Amhara's police chief came out in his book and said that they prepared for war um, prior to the, um, the outbreak of, of war. Um, and there was also you know, the building up of drone capacity um, acknowledged by the Prime Minister without the knowledge of, um, of, of you know, Tigrayan leaders, let's say. Um, and then on the Tigrayan side, there was all this preparation for war as well. And then finally, they, 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 it was the final trigger for the war was undoubtedly um, the Tigrayan takeover of the Northern Command. I just don't think there's any, any controversy here. It, 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 was, it was obvious. You could read the crisis group reports before the war, uh, telling people that war was coming unless something was done about it. Um, and indeed, um, there, is evidence of, 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 uh, there is evidence of the federal government preparing for military intervention in Tigray prior to November the 3rd and on November the 3rd. Um, moving now more to the issue of the impact on the civilians. Um, one question is, how do you judge the situations of Tigrayans living outside of the Tigray region, for example, for example, in Addis Abeba? Well, it, 
very worrying. And, and of course, because of some of the, the, the potential trajectories that I've described, um, they could face um, increasing um, harassment um, as, as Tigrayans in general are accused of, of being part um, associated with the TPLF. Um, that does seem to have cooled off somewhat for now um, in terms of Tigrayans in Addis. I'm sure there's all sorts of um, problems that are still occurring. I believe it's still difficult for people to travel out of the country. Um, but we have seen um, Tigrayans at large, um, whether they are in the military, the federal police, the federal bureaucracy, the Addis Ababa bureaucracy, private organizations, other state public institutions. Um, we have seen um, people um, suffer um, harassment by the authorities and essentially be targeted because of their ethnicity and because of their suspected association and maybe support for the TPLF. That's been um, a huge problem throughout this, in this conflict so far. And like I say, I think everyone should be vigilant, even if there does seem to be less um, of a concern um, than it was in, in November and December, because of the ongoing conflict and the potential trajectories that I've talked about, um, then we could see a return to that. Something we haven't talked about, of course, is this sort of looming um, prospect of a Tigrayan secessionist movement. And again, you know, if that Tigrayan secessionist movement did build strength, then we could expect, uh, unfortunately, the harassment of Tigrayans across Ethiopia um, and indeed outside Ethiopia to, to continue and, and quite possibly increase. Maybe a uh, link to that, but seeing it a bit more broadly, like what's the risk of the violence spreading to other parts of, um, of Ethiopia or also in the sense that it destabilizes the political system of Ethiopia so much that it will aggravate other already existing conflicts in themselves becoming armed conflicts more widely. So the scenario of either the conflict in Tigray expands to the rest of the country or the violence, or that it triggers other um, conflicts in the country. Well, we've seen a reported Tigrayan attack inside northern Amhara recently. Um, but I think it's reasonable to assume that for now, the conflict itself will remain concentrated in Tigray region for now. Um, and I talked about you know, this potential for um, a, you know, a sort of negative cumulative domino effect um, if the federal military really gets bogged down in, 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 in Tigray, um, if the federal government loses credibility because some of its claims surrounding the conflict um, end up becoming unsustainable. Um, and then of course that tension with Sudan. So I, I've talked about that potentially spiraling effect. Um, maybe therefore I will answer in terms of the context of the upcoming delayed election, which is scheduled for the 5th of June. Um, as I see things, Ethiopia is very volatile, but probably the most likely path forward is that the Tigray conflict continues, but is somewhat, um, the rest of Ethiopia is, is somewhat cushioned uh, protected from the effects of it, um, and that the ruling party manages to win a majority in an election, which will probably not be a particularly impressive democratic exercise. And the reason for that, or one of the major reasons for that, is the situation in Oromia. There is a great deal of popular discontent in Oromia about the course of this transition. Um, there has been a return to political repression in Oromia. Um, this is amid you know, serious intercommunal violence, um, particularly which has afflicted Amhara um, people in Oromia. Um, and then we saw in July a very wide ranging sweep of arrests um, of Oromia uh, political leaders and, and activists. And that has led to the de facto boycott of the election by opposition parties in Oromia. So this means that we don't really have the prospects for a competitive election because of those boycotts and the return to political repression. But at the moment, as I see the situation, there is a growing armed insurgency in Oromia, but it doesn't seem that strong or popular at the moment. Um, there is lots of discontent, but compared to the protest movement that brought Abiy Ahmed to power, essentially, the Oromo opposition seems relatively weak, fragmented, a little leaderless and a bit directionless at the moment. And that leads me to think that unless there is 
a intensifying of the Tigray conflict that leads to this weakening um, of the federal government's position. Government may well be able to um, keep in control of the overall situation, even if it's in the context of a return um, to state repression, unimpressive democratic exercise. Talking about the elections, is there a risk that um, there will, that the elections in June that you mentioned, that they will not be held in Tikari because of the security situation? And if so, what would be the implications of that? The elections are not scheduled for Tigray at the moment because Tigray is under a, a state of emergency. And you know, the real reason is that conflict is, is ongoing. Um, so until there is a considerable improvement in the security situation, let's say, um, then elections will not occur um, in, in Tigray. I think, you know, just obvious conclusions from that, it's very, going to be very hard to come to any sort of political resolution of this situation um, until, um, until elections occur. But that, of course, opens up the question of the September regional election in, in Tigray. As I've mentioned several times, um, the Tigrayan position, by and large, is that there must be negotiations with the TPLF leadership, um, who previously were the ruling party in Tigray, and essentially the results of Tigray's September regional election must be honored by the federal government. In turn, that is not a position that the federal government looks at all likely to entertain. Um, and as I've described, the conflict is ongoing. So I think it's kind of fair to say that not only are elections not scheduled in Tigray, um, so the rest of the federation will vote, but Tigray will not, um, but there are no immediate prospects for that situation changing. Thank you. Um, another question, um, which hasn't been addressed yet, which I think is, is quite interesting, is all quite important, is how likely is the crisis likely to affect Ethiopia's troop contributions to peacekeeping operations? I think it already has affected those uh, peacekeeping contributions. We've seen um, a huge amount of suspicion um, fall upon Tigrayan members of the armed forces. Um, and as I mentioned, um, Tigrayan officers in particular, um, who were stationed with the Northern Command of the Federal Military in Tigray, they uh, effectively defected and, and, and sided with the regional government in Tigray. That led to action being taken against Tigrayan members of the military elsewhere. So this has already had an impact on Amazon, um, on UNMIS um, and, and elsewhere. Um, we should just not forget here that you know, the Northern Command was a major, uh, the, the largest con contingent of the Ethiopian military. Uh, Tigrayans, um, because of their, um, their role, their major role in, in, in creating um, the military or, or reforming the military in the federal era uh, because they took power as an insurgency. Uh, they were, Tigrayans were still an, a, a, a major component um, of, of the military itself, despite efforts to sort of rebalance the military along ethno-regional lines in Ethiopia. So there's already been a huge blow to Ethiopia's military, a massive rupture within it. Um, and whilst Ethiopia is focused on this internal conflict and has the prospect of a regional interstate conflict with Sudan, it's going to be very difficult for Ethiopia to, um, to maintain its peacekeeping commitments and very difficult for it to um, increase them. Um, in, within the EU, there's been discussions about the possibilities of imposing sanctions on Eritrea for its involvement um, in, in the conflict. What is your view about the advisability or the usefulness of such sanctions? I think there is um, a, a major question mark about um, whether the Eritrean um, government will, will respond to those sanctions. Um, but at the same time, um, I think the international approach to the conflict is moving very rapidly. Um, probably the, the action we've seen so far um, is not going to, to have any impact. Um, but, um, but, it, but, but yeah, it, 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 it is very dynamic. And so we will see um, what action the uh, European Union takes in the future. Um, as well as the, um, the US administration and, and other international actors. Maybe that will become so concerted um, and, um, and, and, and punitive that it will lead to some response from the Eritrean um, government in, in, in the lines demanded by the international community. But you know, also important to go back to those points I made in the introduction, 
I think President Azayas' main and uh, ongoing motivation here is to destroy the TPLF as a political force, and that has not been achieved yet. So he is also likely to try and um, maintain, um, you know, to try and um, achieve that objective. What do you see more broadly as a as a possible role for the the EU here? Like, what kind of actions could it undertake? Not only again um, towards Eritrea, but within the the conflict more broadly. What role can or should it play? Um, so sorry, I was just reading a question. Can you repeat that one, Valerie? Sorry. Yeah, sorry, that's one of my questions. So you won't uh, find it written in the comments. So it's more about what role can the EU play at the present um, in the conflict? Well, I think the EU um, should make its current approach to the, the conflict. It's taking the situation incredibly seriously. Um, it's suspended budget support to Ethiopia based on human rights concerns. It's spoken out about the Eritrean role. Um, I'm sure it's trying to work in, in harmony with its international allies on the situation. Um, I think maybe there's an increasing need for, for people to look at things a little bit more holistically, um, something the crisis group is, is, is trying to do, um, you know, what can be done to lower these tensions between Ethiopia and Sudan, um, because as discussed, that has the potential to exacerbate the Tigray situation and lead to potentially some sort of broader regional conflagration. The EU has also been fairly intimately involved in the Renaissance Dam negotiations. It's very important that everyone remains vigilant and looks for creative solutions and likely what is to be sort of incremental, pragmatic steps forward towards cooperation um, over, the, over, over the Nile issue. Um, so I think there's, you know, th those, those are the areas where the EU essentially already is focusing and just needs to kind of maintain its, uh, maintain its, its presence, I think. Um, I just noted there's a question in, in, the, in the, the chat box rather than the Q&A, um, which perhaps needs addressing from, from yes. me. Should I, should so, I go ahead and, and speak to that? Uh, yes, it's a follow up on the um, uh, previous questions that you answered of that person. Um, so, yeah, if you want to. OK, I, I'm, I'm not sure. How, I'm not sure I want to get into this into this the debate. I don't, the, the, question, the question seems to have the follow up doesn't seem to. Um, follow-up doesn't seem to follow from the previous question and, and answer but I mean I think that the, 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 the Amhara police chief clearly said that there were preparations made um, in terms of the, the, the mobilization of Amhara forces in, in advance um, of the Tigray takeover of the northern command so I, I, I didn't say that you know the question says this this I think it says this doesn't imply that the federal defense forces and Amhara forces fired the first bullet but of course I didn't say that um, it, was, it was just the Amhara police chief seemed to provide some corroboration um, of the Tigrayan claim that there was active mobilization and preparation for federal intervention and a federal intervention that included the Amhara regional forces. I don't, I don't know if I've got that right. I'm a bit confused by, um, by the question, but that's my best effort. The, the way I understand the comment is that because the person previously asked, um, was this a pre-planned and basically who pulled the trigger first? And that the, the participant uh, seems to argue that it is um, the federal forces who started the conflict. So that even you explained how both sides were preparing for the conflict, um, but that the participant is arguing that. Um, oh, sure. This, okay. This, yeah. Sorry, I, I, I get it. I am getting confused. I got a, this, in, this in a way implies. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, no, sure. But I mean, they didn't fire the first bullet, right? The first bullet. Uh, I mean, there was an allegation that was a commando raid um, on Mekele with an intention to capture the regional leadership. Um, that's never been corroborated, verified, to my understanding. It seems to me that the Tigrayan leadership um, had you know, sort of reasonable grounds to believe that there was going to be a, an imminent intervention and then they took this move against the Northern the Federal Military. So I think that probably the Tigrayans technically fired the first bullet, but really I wanted to move away from this debate and talk about the political dispute that made conflict almost inevitable. Like I think it's much more constructive um, in this like very critical situation for people to focus on, on those, um, the disputes at the, at the root of the war. Thank you for, um 
these further details. Someone's also asking whether you could give a bit more information about the situation of the freedom of the press in Ethiopia when it comes to reporting about the Tigray conflict. And then also asking, are you yourself still welcome in Addis Ababa? Um, I'm um, I'm operating from from Nairobi at the moment, and, and Crisis Group is in discussions with the Ethiopian government about our access to Ethiopia. Um, the reporting on the conflict from Ethiopia has been you know, very disappointing, I think, from from every perspective. Of course, it's an incredibly difficult environment at the moment for Ethiopian journalists. Um, there has been some very enterprising efforts um, to go to Tigray and, and to try and report on the situation there. Um, I think a lot of journalists in Addis have just fallen into line with the federal government's narrative, um, but also are understandably succumbing to a, a certain amount of fear about the repercussions of reporting on the Tigray conflict in a certain way. Um, I think that's a very, another very worrying indicator of the state of the freedom of the press in Ethiopia. Um, until there is much better reporting from Ethiopian journalists and Ethiopian human rights monitors across Ethiopia with all of its um, conflicts and political disputes, it's going to be very hard um, for the country to move forward. Um, and I think that really has been highlighted um, by the Tigray situation. Um, very limited reporting about the actual situation um, in, 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 in Tigray, um, um, to my understanding. Um, and I think also, you know, we, like, we understand that a huge number of people have died in this conflict, combatants and, and civilians. So, for example, for um, from the Ethiopian media about the impact of the war on Ethiopian families across the country who must have suffered um, loved ones um, in their hundreds, um, if not in their, in their thousands. So I think, yeah, there's a, a huge um, number of, 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 of critical questions are raised um, by the reporting on the conflict so far. Then there's also a question that goes in a bit um, deeper on the issue that you raised about the um, objectives and the, the involvement of the Amhara. So the question is, how do you see the impact of the involvement of the Amhara in this conflict? And also what is reported about their involvement in, and I cannot pronounce, I, I will butcher that name, so I'm sorry, to so their involvement in Benishangul to the south on the overall regional balance in Ethiopia. Is it an attempt to regain their pre-1991 predominance? It's, it's huge raised here um so you know very very difficult to cover i think maybe you know, most relevant to the, this discussion um let's let's talk about the amhara reclaiming of, of territory in, in tigray that's a long-held objective by by certain amhara political elements they say that the tplf annexed um what was effectively amhara land in order to ensure that uh, Tigray had an international border to Sudan. So the Amhara position now, and this is blessed by the regional leadership, is that um, those, those areas should never have been part of Tigray under the, um, under the federal system. They should have rightfully been part of Amhara region, and they seem very, very committed to that stance. That creates a gigantic and very acute political problem um, in Tigray and, and for the federal government. Does the federal government bless um, what is, it seems in strictly illegal constitutional terms um, and an illegal alteration of regional boundaries? Um, or does it take action to try and change the mind of Amhara's regional government here? Um, you know, both those options seem fraught, um, fraught with problems. Um, it doesn't seem to me, again, you know, a much broader coalition of Tigrayan political actors and people than the TPLF, it doesn't seem that any of them really accept um, the Amhara reclaiming of these territories in Western and Southern Tigray. So it isn't at all clear um, you know, where the kind of peaceful path forward is, is with regards to that issue. And instead, it's easy to see a path forward of, of conflict in terms of those territorial disputes. I think we have seen you know, some of these long held um, Amhara positions have obviously been realized. Uh, we've seen increasing prominence of some Amhara politicians. Um, this is not you know, a new development. This has been brewing for years. Um, a part of the Amhara claims, um, well, first of all, you know, the Amhara claim is that the, the TPLF is an anti-Amhara um, entity and that ethno-nationalism in Ethiopia um, is an anti-Amhara ideology. 
and that the federal system itself is an anti-Amhara construct. Like that's the root of many Amhara complaints here. Um, and I think that sort of materializes in terms of the increasing concern and activism surrounding the treatment of Amhara minorities in areas of Ethiopia um, that are not Amhara region. So particularly in Oromia, also in these areas of Tigray, they have just reclaimed, but also in Beni Shangul. So there is this allegation, um, and, and indeed there is plenty of evidence, um, discrimination and killing of Amhara Syrians um, who find themselves um, minorities and without full um, political rights, as many people see it um, in other regions of Ethiopia other than Amhara. What accompanies this are these territorial claims, these irredentist attitudes, that's not just with regards to Tigray, that also re refers to Metakel zone in Beni Shangul, um, which many Amhara, uh, well, we, which was part of Gojam province, um, and many people therefore think should be part of our regional state. The huge fundamental um, political questions and, and divisions um, at the moment, certainly, clearly, you know, passions are, are running high um, and we have seen these Amhara positions have turned into the actual reclaiming of territory forcefully in Tigray. So there is certainly reason to fear um, that there will be you know, a continuation of that type of action and potentially um, a, you know, a, a blowback um, from other political entities in Ethiopia. I don't think I want, you know, want to get into this idea of, um, of like Amhara trying to reclaim their glory days, but suffice to say, um, Ethiopia's political actors, including the Amhara wing of the ruling party and the Oromia wing of the ruling party, are pulling in significantly different directions at times. Um, you know, there, is, there is a power struggle there, um, and there is a need for both of those political leaderships to essentially appeal to their own constituencies in Amhara and Oromia. And they have very different conceptions um, of Ethiopia's imperial past and who held power, the level of subjugation of the Oromo people, let's say, and I guess more relevantly, you know, how to divide political power and other resources um, in the current era. So there's all sorts of problems um, that, are, that, are throw, that, that are emerging, that are present in Ethiopia at the moment. And maybe, you know, just to, to speak to these problems very briefly, the you know, crisis group and many others repeatedly have said that because of these fundamental schisms in Ethiopian society um, and the actual destabilization and violence they are causing, there is a need for a national dialogue or a similar process uh, for Ethiopia's political elites and others to try and chart a way forward here and try and come to some sort of consensus about Ethiopia's past. Thank you. Um, and then as the chair's privilege, I would like to ask maybe the final question because we have about 10 minutes um, left for this webinar. Um, with regards to human rights violations and reports of atrocities, which we've seen now the Ethiopian authorities recognizing that such atrocities have um, been committed. What prospect do you see for the Ethiopian uh, authorities to provide some measure of justice for this? Uh, or is there, do you see any room for like an AU or a UN led commission of investigation being sent at some point um, to provide a report and recommendations on measures of justice and redress for these atrocities. Great. Um, Ethiopian officials and authorities um, have spoken out against some of the abuses that have occurred in Tigray, whether that's for example, some of the interim officials, for example. Um, we have now seen the prime minister himself talk about atrocities in, in Tigray. Um, we have seen the commitment to investigate and prosecute people for these crimes. They also the promise to work in partnership with international actors, the UN and the AU. Um, maybe starting with the domestic, um, I think it's evident that you know, members of the Ethiopian National Defense Forces who've been involved in atrocities um, could well find themselves the subject of of disciplinary processes. Um, that could well occur for Eritrean forces as well, perhaps for Amhara um, elements. 
Um, there will be prosecutions led, I imagine, by the Federal Attorney General's office. We will see continued reporting and monitoring of abuses um, by the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission, an autonomous federal institution. Um, I think that will continue. Um, and there is a need to respond to the international concerns, to the domestic concerns, to the complaints of Ethiopian victims about these violations. We will see some sort of response from the federal authorities. As expressed in my presentation, um, my concern is that you know, these atrocities have been part and parcel of the conflict. Um, the civilians are a problem in Tigray for the federal government and for the Eritrean forces because of what is their apparent uh, sympathies towards the armed resistance and their elected leaders as they see it, who've been removed from power. So there is a big concern at Crisis Group that despite these efforts, these acknowledgements from the federal government and what will be some efforts to investigate and prosecute, that we could well see a continuation of violence against civilians um, because of those conflict dynamics. To talk about the international component here, um, we have seen something of an opening, first of all, in Tigray in terms of access for media organizations, let's see. Um, let's say, um, also talk of working with the um, UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and I believe maybe they have some presence in Tigray already. I think, you know, that is a promising sign in terms of understanding the scale of atrocities um, and beginning to you know, it, it expose them, investigate them and, and bring people to justice. Um, what we don't know yet is how far the government is willing to do to go in terms of cooperating with, for example, a UN investigation. It's evident from the federal government's statements subsequent to this um, you know, increased receptiveness to investigations, joint investigations, that they favor investigations by the African Union, Commission on Human and People's Rights. Uh, um, you know, Tigrayans will say that's, that's insufficient. Um, but like I say, you know, just how far the Ethiopian government will go in terms of its cooperation with the international community um, in terms of investigating atrocities is something that we, we haven't seen full access yet and um, to my understanding for, for example, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and other similar international organizations, NGOs, to do their work in Tigray. So we will have to talk about that. And I think maybe to make the obvious point with regards to the domestic um, processes, um, whether it's in Tigray or elsewhere in Ethiopia, the, the federal government will always refer to its legal mandate um, to investigate and, 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 and prosecute. But the problem is, of course, that Ethiopian opposition actors and others, they accuse the state, they accuse the federal government and the ruling party of um, being engaged in, in itself. Um, and therefore there is the allegation, of course, this leads to the focus on international processes um, that the Ethiopian government cannot investigate itself. So even though I believe that there will be um, efforts by those federal institutions, uh, by the regional authorities in Tigray, by the military, the federal military, and that will not be considered sufficient by, um, by plenty of Ethiopian um, opposition actors in particular, but also Ethiopian people. Thank you very much. And with that, we've come to the end of this webinar. I would like to thank you, William, for participating for your presentation and also to the participants for all the questions that they've asked. I think it's been a very interesting discussion, very useful. Um, exchanges on the situation and the possible implications of um, the conflict. Um, just like to inform the public that our next Africa lunch meeting will be on the 1st of April and it will be on Rwanda with Bert, uh, Bert Ingelar, sorry. Uh, so we look forward to seeing some of you there. And again, William, thank you very much for joining us today. Okay, thank you very much, Valerie. And thank you to everyone for listening and for their questions. Thank you. Have a nice day, everyone.